Hi, and welcome to Preview. My name is Guy Giampapa. Preview. 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 Hello and welcome to Preview. Uh, we've got a great show for you today, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. But first, let's talk about theater. Who's the fairest lady in town? At the moment, she happens to be appearing on stage at the Lyric Theater. Her name is Jennifer Ellis, and she's wowing the audience with her portrayal of Eliza Doolittle in Scott Edmonston's production of My Fair Lady. Fresh from her work at Gloucester Stage and Regal Music Theater, Ellis is going strong playing the British waif who yearns to become a lady with an assist from Christopher Hsu as Henry Higgins. Ellis brings a special talent to the role. I don't compare her Eliza with others. Hers is unique. And as for Chu, unlike Rex Harrison and others who speak their, the, the lyrics, Crew talks and sings his part. It comes off convincingly. Others who deserve recognition are Jared Troilo as Freddie, his On the Street Where You Live closes Act One to a thrilling applause. Remo Eraldi as Colonel Pickering, J.T. Turner as Alfred P. Doolittle, Cheryl McMahon as Mrs. Pierce, and Beth Gotha as Mrs. Higgins all contribute to make My Fair Lady a successful show. And we should mention music director Catherine Stornetta and the award-winning scenic designer Janie E. Howland, whose innovative sets are always pleasing to the eye. All in all, My Fair Lady at the Lyric Stage is a show not to be missed. Well, in honor of the 100th birthday of the late playwright Arthur Miller, New Rep's artistic director Jim Patoza has selected one of Miller's last works to open his 2015-16 season. Broken Glass is a strong and emotional drama about a Brooklyn woman who is suffering an unknown paralysis of the legs. The time is November 11th, 1938, and she's obsessed with the news from Germany where the Nazis are terrifying the Jews. She's lost her ability to walk, and her husband has, assured the, has, accused, has secured the advice of Dr. Harry Hyman. As the story unveils, we learn of her husband's emotional problems, his resentment and guilt while struggling with his Jewish identity. Jim Patoza has cast six actors to tell the story. Anne Go Gottlieb, I'm sorry, Anne Gottlieb is Sylvia, the wife. Her husband is played by Jeremiah Kissel. Benjamin Everett is Harry Hyman, the doctor, who becomes emotionally entangled with Sylvia. Broken Glass is an Olivier Award-winning and Tony-nominated drama. New Rep's version is intense and highly dramatic. Broken Glass keeps an audience wondering how it will conclude. Does Sylvia regain her health, and does her husband resolve his problems? The answer comes in the last moments of the play. Broken Glass ranks as one of Miller's best. Well, that's our theater bit. Now I want to tell you about our show. Our guest today is Julie Stein. I had the extreme privilege of talking with him many years ago. You know, as you know, Julie Stein was the composer of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Funny Girl, and Gypsy, among others. Well, he was a marvelous interviewer, and I want to share that with you now. Here it is, Julie Stein. Julie, the story of composer Julie Stein. He's our guest tonight on Hollywood Backlot. My name is Guy Giampapa. And I can't say any more about Julie Stein, but welcome, Julie. Glad to be here. It's nice terrific to having you. you with us. Thank you. <laughs> Julie, that's a fantastic book. I spent Saturday evening and part of Sunday reading it. And I not only read it, but I reread portions of it. There's so much beautiful material in there, especially the Hollywood story. Now, I, I want to talk about that tonight, if we can. Lovely. You, you must have a million stories about it. Please tell me about it. Well, uh, the Hollywood story. Now, why don't you choose a personality because there's so many, uh, Marilyn Monroe or Frank Sinatra or... Okay, or let's do it in sequence. Let's start with Republic Pictures. Republic Pictures. Well, as you well know, I was brought out to 20th Century Fox to coach Shirley Temple mm -hmm. and Alice Faye. Uh, this was late in 1941, say, and uh, show them what to sing, how to, to sing the numbers by Daryl Sanek, the head of the studio. And uh, lo and behold, The Purge came, and Daryl Sanic, the head of the studio, suggested, why don't you write songs? I said, I did that already, Judge. He said, when did you write songs? I said, well, I wrote a song in 1929, which was one of the big hits called Sunday. But I don't want to write songs. Songs are for older people. I thought so. All my lyric writers were older men, so I thought <laughs> songwriting was for older people. And uh, he said, I'm going to get you a job at Republic Studios, but you'll write songs. And uh, I was a gambling fellow though then, and you know, he said, look, you're only gonna get $135 a week where you're getting 1,500 here. I said, I can't make it on 135. He said, you'll make it, you're a gambler. Gamble on yourself for a change. And so I took the job at Republic Studios. Well, 
Republic Studio then was a sea of mud. You could never <laughs> get in a, a sea of mud. The, it, for some reason, it, when it rained in the valley in California, the, this whole <laughs> studio had no cement on the sidewalk or pavements. It was a sea of mud. But the cowboy seemed to relish in it. And I wrote for Gene Autry, mm -hmm. his horse. You wrote so, for the horse, too? I wrote too? for the horse, too. I mean, <laughs> everybody doubled. Uh, Roy Rogers, Smiley mm -hmm. Burnett, Gabby Hayes, and Judy Canova. And uh, it was a hysterical piece. You see, my office, my studio where I worked, was really, the front of it was a set saloon in front. They used it as a building, you know. But in back saloon was my office. And when they shot a picture in the saloon, I had to move to another place, some stable somewhere. And, uh, well, those were the days, you know, uh, it's amazing at Republic. Uh, for instance, there was a movie where Smiley Burnett was riding along with Roy Rogers, and they both were eating watermelon. And so the director says, I want a song here called I Love Watermelon. I said, why does he have to sing I Love, why is he singing at all? He says, because he's happy. Well, why can't I write him a song, the sun's bright today or something? He says, no, this cowboy is happy when he says I Love Watermelon. I mean, just absolutely insanity. <laughs> but the good things did come from Republic. I wrote my first song with, with uh, Frank Lesser. Oh, yes, yeah, a great song. Right? But I'll tell you a lovely story. Mm -hmm. Frank Lesser came over to do a musical at Republic. And he hated me for bringing him through Republic. See, he was working at Paramount, making his way there. It seemed that Frank Lesser was writing all the hit songs at, at uh, Paramount, like Says My Heart, Jingle Jangle, mm -hmm. all those songs. But Johnny Mercer was getting all the big pictures, and he says, you've demeaned me, Julie. I said, no, Frank, I asked you to come over here. You see, I'm starting out as a songwriter in movies, and I, wanted, I want to write hit songs, and you know how to write a hit song, because you're the best. And so he says, well, all right, play me something, kid. And so I sat down at the piano and played, da 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 He said, shh, we'll never play that again here. I'm going to take you to Paramount. We'll write it at Paramount. <laughs> of course, subsequently we wrote, I Don't Want to Walk Without You, Baby, which was my first real big hit in the movies. Julie, was that what you called one of your trunk songs? I know in the book you, uh, you had these songs that you said, well, I'll use them later. Did Shall you I put tell them you in the trunk? Using later? Please do. I really don't have a trunk. Yes, I have a trunk. You see, after I wrote my first song in 1929 and didn't write again until 1940, you see, my trunk is my brain. I see. A lot of songs were stored in there. Mm. The years that I should have been writing, I didn't write. So therefore, when I did start writing in 1940, it was all there. You see, I don't write at a piano. I think the fellows who have trunk songs are the fellows who compose them at the piano. Mm -hmm. You know, and they, they play, and they remember their trunk songs. Yeah. I, even as I sit and talk to you now, I'm probably writing some song. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's, I, I replenish my brain all the time with songs. And if I have to work, like say this afternoon I had to start on a movie or a play, all I have to know is the story, the character, and the plot points. I will sit down and write. And what I write for that scene or that special scene the lyric writer will know it fits because I'm a dramatist and it fits. Right. I never doodle. I never, hey, I'll try this, like you do at the piano. See, the piano is a, gives you, a, for me, is false to write music at because I play very well and anybody plays very well. They're flattering their ego how they play. I see. And they're not giving credence or first mm -hmm. position to the melodic texture. They're seeing how well it'll sound and that's false writing. I think one has to, be stark, naked, with that pencil in a dark room, so to speak. People, that's a great song, Julie. It really is. You must, you, you must have a great understanding of people to be able to write a song that way. Yes, I love people, and uh, that song was so wonderful, and it certainly suited Barbara Streisand very well. You know I was responsible for putting Barbara in the show. Yes. <laughs> Subconsciously, for Funny Girl, we had Anne Bancroft sign, 
but I went and heard Barbara for 27 straight nights in a restaurant in the village of New York, and I was so impressed that subconsciously I was writing my whole score for her, but we had Anne Bancroft sign for the part. And but great thing happened, Anne Bancroft said, you'll never get anybody to sing that difficult score. You know, Rain on My Parade is a rather difficult yes, song. It it's a very physical was, song. Yeah, too, and it? music that makes me dance. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember Rain on My Parade? Yes. And, and, and music that makes me dance, difficult score, and Barb, and, uh, and said, uh, you'll never get anyone to sing and act the part. And Jerome Robbins, our director, said, well, if we don't, we won't have a show. But I do know one thing, this is the score. And so uh, it was very gratifying to me that I gambled on my opinion of Barbara, and she turned out so wonderful in the show. Oh. And so people has a great significance for me. It was a smash success. You know, I have no favorite song. You know, people ask me, what is your favorite song? I've written 1,400 songs. They're like children. I, I like them equally well. The moments in my life that have to do with people where a certain song was written, that seems to be my most important part because where I've done things for people or they've done things for me, my whole life's been based like that. I enjoy the spirit of people. And I think if you don't, you're missing an awful lot in life. I played in burlesque theaters when I was a Boy, you really? Chicago. I was about 12 years old, you know, we were very poor people, anything to make a dollar, you know. Julie, there is something I want to say about Gypsy, and I've been wanting to say this to you all morning. I took my daughter Susan to see that. It was her first Broadway, sh or her first uh, musical play that she had ever seen. She was 14 years old at the time, and she came out loving the theater. To me, Gypsy is the American, American opera. It's something that's going to live on forever and ever. And I say that because I really mean it. it. It's a great classical story. The music is absolutely beautiful. It'll never die. Shall I play a short overture? Oh, please do. Our, our audience Since you love it so that. much? Please do. And it was a big hit here in Boston. That's right. This is where it all happened. That's right. All right. Please play it. Thank you. entertain you let me see you smile let me do a few tricks some old and then some new tricks I'm very versatile and if you're real good I'll make you feel good I want your spirits to fly so let me entertain you and we'll have a real good time yes sir
I and there you are. Oh, that's fantastic. <coughs> that's absolutely beautiful. You heard that burlesque music in that, Yes, didn't you? I did, yeah. yeah. The Chicago uh, That's right. Touch. Chicago reared its <laughs> ugly head into <laughs> the gypsy. Um, Let me ask you something. Why did Ethel Merman not do that in movies? Why did well, she not play the that's lead? that's the Hollywood picture that you know so well. You, we always, they always uh, figured, well, we'll get somebody else. You know, mm -hmm. it, uh, some of those things are, like the movie of Funny Girl, the stage play of Funny Girl, I thought was absolutely brilliant. And the character, as played by Barbara, Fanny Bryce, mm -hmm. made her a strong woman, what Fanny Bryce was. No self-pity at the end when the man walks out on her. It was both of their faults, but she didn't weep over it in the stage play. She sang, she became strong. Yes. She says, uh, remember she sings, uh, I'll cry a little later. Yes. But nobody's, nobody, it's gonna rain on my parade. That's the way the curtain came down. She was a strong woman. In the play, in the movie rather, they make the movie, and all of a sudden at the end of the play, she says, oh my man, I love him so. That is a good song, but it defeated the character in the play. She became a self-pitying woman. She lost her strength, and I think that's one of the reasons the play didn't, the movie, did not win the Academy it was Award. It's effective. Of course, you do something on Broadway, uh, and it becomes very emotional to the audience, and you, uh, you repeat it the same way in a movie, and it's nothing. It's, no. It, the there's impact some, is not there. There's something marvelous about the theater, and I think it's no. the greatest medium for uh, expression for at least for me for a creator you live and die by your own work in other yes. words if it's bad you take all the blame and, and rightfully so if it's good you get all the blame see in Hollywood you're an accommodator you're not a creator they tell you musically I'm speaking now mm -hmm. they tell you what they want musically they look upon songwriters as nothing out there they mistreated Rogers and Hart in the beginning. Very shabbily did they treat Dick Rogers. They call them the songwriters. And they don't have the, the respect that the theater, not only that, when, you, when you're in the theater, you use your imagination more. You come involved with the drama. It's, you know that they're going to change scenery in the theater, right. but you still right. live in that fantasy that, look at that, that we're in another place. There. The magic is mm -hmm. there. You know, and there's no magic in movies. I'm not, I love movies, uh, the good ones, uh, but the magic is gone, and uh, there's something very special about the theater, and the theater is growing and growing and growing. I, there isn't, I suppose there isn't a small town, village, or city, whatever, that doesn't have a theater group. Uh, there's no question that the great American music was written for the stage, not for movies, really. Of course. Uh, but there is one exception to that, and that's the songs that Julie Stein composed for movies. Now, you've got a, I don't know how many times you were nominated for Academy Awards. Uh, seven was, times. Was it seven times? It took me eighth, the eighth time to win. I think the, you know what it is? I think there comes a time when they say, let, let's let him win it this year. <laughs> and usually you win it for the wrong song. Then one year in 1953, Mr. Sinatra said, Julie, I think you're gonna win it at long last this year. And he says, and you better get yourself a new tuxedo. Well, I ordered myself a new tuxedo and uh, I called my tailor in New York. I said, you have the measurements. The idea is not how well you make it. You gotta have it here in five days. And in five days it came just a day before the Academy Awards. And that night I went to the Academy Awards with my new tuxedo and they did announce my name. And the song was, oh, I must tell you the end of it. After I won the Academy Award, I came home at the party and it was a telegram from my tailor and expecting congratulations. He had much to watch it on television. But instead, it didn't say congratulations. It said, Julie, I must take the shoulder in an inch and a half. And here is the song.
Coins in the Fountain, the right. Oscar winner. You finally made it, Julie. Finally made Bravo. it. Uh, we promised our audience we'd tell them the story about the Pope. Tell yeah. me that story now. Well, of all the, there are about 500 stories in my book, as you well know. <laughs> right. I, I love this because there was so much wonderful warmth and truth in this whole story. I was very impressed. I w always wanted an audience with his highness, and Pius was Pope mm -hmm. then. Pius XII. Right. 1956. And uh, I was over in Rome for the first time, and someone arranged an audience. To my surprise, at all. well, first of all, I, I got a citation from the Italian government for writing three coins in a fountain, and it was a big thing. Mm. You should see all the business they did account <laughs> of my song. Thousands of people around there with three coins in a fountain. <laughs> and so uh, that very momentous day, I, there I was in front of His, Highness, His Holiness uh, Pius. Wonderful man, bright. Mm. In fact, I went to a mass where he spoke in 16 languages. Oh. Did a mass in 16 languages. Unbelievable. The following Sunday, he invited me. But then he spoke about the song, and he had a great sense of humor. He says, uh, "You know, there are many Italians claim they wrote that song. How should you, why should you have written that song?" And he said, uh, "How did you write it?" And a few more questions. And asked me if I knew Phil Silvers. Phil really? Silvers had an audience with Pope Pius. Oh, <laughs> really? Phil Silvers being the best friend. And on the way out, he says, you know, I have never heard it, which I thought was very sweet. And I said, well, you know, it's always more people have heard than not heard. He laughed. He says, how does it go? And I said, pure Mascagni. <laughs> As you well know, the end of make it mine, da, da, da. That's like the aria from Cavalier, right, you know. Right, Chinese music. Yeah, <laughs> and so he laughed at that. And I, was very, I always remember pure musk, I and mean, he laughed. Oh, was that funny? Isn't that sweet? You, shows you that he was a human being, too. Well, he, he <laughs> certainly is bright. He was a bright man. And uh, sadly, uh, the next he passed away that same year. He died in the summer that That's year. That's right, he did, yeah. Late summer that year, or the early fall, something I know. I'm yeah. not quite sure now. Well, Julie, it's been a great experience for me, especially, to have you here on the Hollywood Backlot. Uh, and I just want to tell our viewers that this book here has many, many more stories, like the, uh, the story of Pope Pius. Well, it's a story of the yearn to live. I've enjoyed my life. It's the people in it that have made my life. That's what counts. Well, it shows in the book, Julie, and I want everybody to go out and buy it. It's an absolutely fantastic book. It tells you about... Uh, Julie in London, where he was born, his early days in Chicago, uh, his experiences in Hollywood, and then the ultimate, Broadway. Oh, and it's... my period with Frank Sinatra, which is hilarious. Oh, you've, you've got to read it just for the Sinatra stuff alone. Julie, thanks so much for being part of our show today. Thank you. It's been we'll never forget this. Enjoyable. I hope you'll come back in the near oh, future yeah, next time Boston, you come to Boston. Anyhow. Okay, thanks, Julie.